I am Plea. And there's a bunch of people, there's more people here to speak than <laughs> 10 people to listen. No, it doesn't matter what line you sign in on. Yeah, it's no sign here. We ran, out of, here. we ran out of the fresh papers. So the coffee, water, if you guys want some hot water, it's over here. It's almost ready. Oh, you know, like I did it in 2010, and then these guys said, well, come back and get your thing last year. And, um, yeah, Diane so was trying to make in. it, but she doesn't need all that. Oh, really? I mean, I've been trying to talk to 30 volunteers. Oh, 40, but it's getting that 40, but then they can be clear until maybe the first slide. It's kind of true. Okay, so I'll introduce Steve Anderson with Valley County. This guy right over here is Valley County Weed Department. We talk a lot about invasive species, I'm sure. And Brian McMorris is with the Forest Service. I don't have any clue what he's going to talk about. And Beth, Bethany and Nick are with the state, so we're covered with everybody on yeah. everything. And um, I'll just turn it over to them because they want to go right. All right. I'm glad you have Sam. Oh, some of these and all. There's other chairs. Okay, we're going. Yeah, it's good to be back up here. I think I was up here last year, the year before. I can't remember. It was last year. Last year. Yeah. Is there anybody that was in last year's? Talk? Well, I I was just sitting in the things last year, but last year was last year. Well, this will be a good one. I hope um, Beth and I work for the Mason Species program and Oxford Sweet program down at the state office and um, the transfer department of agriculture but we also play ball with, uh, with lots of county and federal staff too. Um, it's always nice seeing these groups uh, come through the woodwork, woodworks and have a lot of interest and they can be our biggest advocates out there for uh, kind of the stuff that we're doing. The, the first slide is going to be a lot on uh, boat check stuff and then aquatic plant stuff and why that's important. And then we'll jump over and we'll hit some noxious weed stuff with the Forest Service and then hopefully Steve will wrap up with um, some more noxious weed stuff. But I feel like these two programs, they really go together quite nicely just due to some of the characteristics that all these species have. So um, we can pass these around. These we can take home and we've got some other handouts. The little brown books are just good to throw in your pocket and have on hand, and um, they're pretty handy. We also have a few props here that, that we can pass around and people can look at, and we'll use a little bit more in depth a little bit later on. But, yeah, my name's Nick, that's Beth. Maybe we can just, since it's a smaller group, we can just go around and maybe introduce and um, I know kind of the general core of the Master Naturalist, but maybe if I can just get a better idea about what kind of you guys like to do, like kind of different volunteer work or different outreach kind of stuff out there, that would give me a better understanding. Um, coming from where I'm at. Well, uh, Master Naturalists have been uh, incorporating those. It started about four years ago. I think it was 2010 because that was the year I started. Oh, okay. Yeah, so five years ago. Is it nationwide? It's, um, yes, I think yeah. it is. That's fine. I think it's called the National 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 I looked it up, I saw there was a Texas National Master for us. And I think maybe Texas started this organization, everybody else kind of modeled their group after. And we do all kinds of volunteer work for agencies, we work for different, as different as Snowden out on the Lake Creek Road, which is a wildlife sanctuary, to helping school kids. And, um, I, I am in Rapid River 
do the one of the sound. I have several times this kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So we, we did a lot of different things, such as plant trees and barbarian areas or a fishing game, um, whatever anybody asked us to do, we tried. Well, I think this would be some good, some be good background just to have um, and just be aware of when you guys are out here in you know, your field and working with all the you know, good. This is always good to have. Um, this is kind of where this PowerPoint is going, just aquatic invasive species in general. And then we're going to dive into the both the mussel stuff and why it's important, and then aquatic plant stuff. And then we're going to go over kind of what we're going to plan on doing this year, what we did last year, what worked, what didn't, and then how, how these groups um, can help us, help us out and how we can help you, hopefully. There's a few characteristics in general about aquatic invasive species, definitely some stuff you can take home. Um, and this is why noxious weed programs and invasive species programs go quite nicely together is when we're dealing with terrestrial plants, it's, it's just plants. When we're dealing with aquatic invasive species, it's similar characteristics, but just all taxes. And so it can be a, it can be a fish, it can be a mollusk of some kind of crustacean, a pathogen, plants, that kind of thing. So it's just that whole picture. Um, the idea is that these species come into an area that they're not native to. Um, they do quite well, primarily just due to they don't have any predation or any natural checks and balances. They go unchecked and um, they don't, they then can compete with the native good guys. So few to no significant checks um, and then as far as aquatic stuff, they're the most significant threat to native aquatic species. That's kind of where you guys will be more drive towards um, how it can affect the landscape. And then they can also affect water-based infrastructure, too. These are just a few things that are on the, the hot list right now. This list goes on and on and on. But the things, I mean, obviously, the top of the list, zebra quad muscles, this is the props that are up here right now. We'll talk about the muscles. But we're also concerned with New Zealand Muscal Asian clam, a couple of funguses and diseases, and then some various plants that, that folks in, in this room have worked on. Um, things to be aware of, the idea is that these things just get packed around unintentionally, intentionally, whatever it would be, um, to new places. And then this is just some uh, why, why we care about it. Um, the idea is that when they come in here, they come unchecked and then they do quite well and then they affect either the natural environment, the landscape, um, any kind of an infrastructure, hydro dams, irrigation, that kind of stuff. So once, once again, this is kind of a short list, but it kind of depends on which species you're talking about and how it's going to affect the landscape. But, um, long story short is a lot of these species affect one of these items differently or all of all of them together. We were talking about zebra quag mussels. We'll just dive into this more specifically. Um, we'll leave one the license plates we sent down to Lake Mead just recently and then we got them back and, and most of them were pretty well covered with mussels. And then these pipes have been around for a while. This is just a, an ABS AB, that's a kind of a that they set down for some months. Down in Lake Mead. A few things about zebra quagga mussels is they're a freshwater bivalve. We've got a lot of those out native in, the, in Idaho. But these are the only ones that are known to attach. And so when you see something actually attached to a substrate, um, we probably have a problem. Highly variable color patterns, and then some invasive characteristics would be they reproduce very rapidly. We'll cover that here in a little bit. They attach, they filter feed, and they survive out of the water for up to 30 days. And that can be an issue as well. A little bit on the life cycle. You can see we start out at the bottom. The birds and the bees, they spawn. Um, that just goes out in the water column. And then you have a villager, and that's the that's the critter that's up in the top right, and that's just going to drift around 
the water column, and then it's going to decide to settle out and then become an adult, and then just keep <coughs> those three stages in life cycle um, are what we're up against. We're going to each of them individually. Villagers, you're not going to see, and that's the issue with them is when they are in that villager stage, they're very, very small, microscopic. You can only see them under a scope, and they can go undetected by the, the naked eye and and bilge water and balance water and live wells, things of that nature, down in the bottom of a kayak. Um, that's that's what we're up against with the villagers. And they can drift and float in that water column, just kind of in the washing machine tumbling, uh, for up to 30 days. And then they decide once they reach something, a suitable substrate, and that could be like the corner of the boat or the dock or a sheltered area, they'll decide to attach and set up camp. Um, then they're considered a settler. The settlers are, are pretty small, and they kind of have a sandpaper feel. Sometimes I'll just bring in like a 100 grit sandpaper somewhere in there, something that's got some texture to it, um, and have people feel that. And on the bottom of the boat, that's kind of what they're going to feel like. Um, very, very small. You can see the scale picture there. And when you peel one off and just put it on the hand lens, um, they'll have that faint V shape. And they're starting to develop that shell. And this is kind of the stage when they're going to open up and they're going to start grabbing calcium from the water column and food from the water column, trying to build up their shell and get bigger. That way they can later on reproduce. That's the primary goal. And then we always have this case study. We've seen these in Idaho, this type of a boat. We can have a, a boat down in Meter Havasu all winter long, and just due to the, the climate and the water conditions down there in the wintertime, and sitting there for several months over the wintertime, and all it has is just settlers. And um, during the summertime, that shifts, and if you have a boat that's down there for a few months, you'll have an adult. And they can, they're very, very hard to inspect for when they're that small. Do you get rid of them by just wash them off or does it take? Uh, yeah, just hot water. Oh. Them. So that's kind of the main the main thing that we're using now. We're not doing much with chemical. Um, we just have hot water, hot season land as machines at the check stations and then just hot washing boats. That's primarily how we take care of it. So then we're going to go into more of the adult phase, and this is when they definitely are attached more permanently. Um, they're using the distal threads, which is kind of like just a brown thready type material that, um, that they can use to grip angles and attach with. Um, the adults can be quite large. These ones are fairly small. There are some plates that we had that, that came that had some, maybe those, some of those bigger muscles on there. Um, and that just kind of depends on the water conditions. How much food they have, how much calcium they have, how, how good they get in this, so. Wouldn't there be a difference between, you know, you go to Arizona, it's hot. So, yeah. um, I mean, it's, it's not as hot here. What's the temperature range? Well, it, they are, they're in the Great Lakes, and the Great Lakes freezes over oh. the most part. And they get yeah. really cold, so they do quite well there, too. Um, they have a pretty wide temperature range. Oh, um, so do they do better, like in just the, I mean, need is kind of need. It's pretty warm. It yeah. is warm, but it's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. very clear. Yeah, need is um, pretty good muscle habitat. They've grown muscles pretty well. It's mm -hmm. The deal with need and quagga mussels, between the two species, Great Lakes generally have zebra mussels. Of course, now quagga mussels are kind of come in and take it over. Oh. Um, but when you have quagga mussels and zebra mussels in the ring, they're fighting each other, quagga mussels are generally going to come out on top. And that's because they can go deeper. Zebra mussels generally go <coughs> down to 40 feet. Quagga mussels can go down to four or 500 feet. Um, zebra mussels generally only spawn once a year when temperatures are right, and that's somewhere around that. 12 to 18 degrees Celsius range. Um, quagga mussels are the same, but they can spawn continuously throughout the year. 
when the temperatures are in that range. And then it depends on how much food source there is out there. So they eat phytoplankton, which is the tiny microscopic organisms in the water column, and they'll gather that, filter it out, and in that place it will end Meat has lots of food because it has lots of algae and phytoplankton. And they have a quite a bit of calcium in the water column too. And then we've been turned and done studies on Idaho and how our water bodies look as far as calcium, magnesium, um, fish, you know, food, and the space, available space and substrate, and they would do really well. We've got plenty of calcium to build the shells, we've got plenty of food. Our temperatures are just right where they would spawn several times throughout the summer and in the fall. They probably wouldn't spawn as much in the winter time. The temperatures got way, way down. Um, but they would still be very well. So they're not here? They're not here. And I'll show them back here pretty soon about where they're at and their current distribution. And kind of go through the history behind that. Um, so there's a couple things I always point out when I get to this. So in 1988, 1989, a ship came in. Anybody know this? Yep. Boom. Primo. They came in, dumped their ballast water in Lake Erie, I believe, in 1988, 1989. And we have sea brick waga mussels in the Great Lakes. And then another smart cookie. Who, what's this one? Mississippi. Mississippi. Yep. And so you can see here, the mussels got here because they just took the free ride down. Um, they slowly came up rivers jumping on boats. They can't move up a current. They have to get on a boat and move up and then come down. Um, so zebra mussels here and then you can start seeing whole species or just quagga mussels are starting to take hold in these areas as well. Like I was saying earlier, in general, from what I've heard, when you have zebra and quagga mussels together, quagga mussels, but don't think of them as being separate. Think of them as, as two cousins that neither of which you want to come stay the night at the house, you know, <laughs> either of them. So don't, don't try to split them up. <laughs> they're both just cousins and they're bad. Um, and then anybody know this one down here? This area right at the tip of Nevada? Lake Mead. Yep. So they came in Lake Mead in 2007. So 88 and then they slowly came down and then somehow it jumped water bodies and just the idea Lake Mead 2007 and then later on, when we came with our laws, it was in 2008, 2009, it was a direct response of this. But then you can see Havasu and, and later down here, and now they're clear down, they found them clear down in the Gulf of Mexico where the aqueduct comes out. Now it's all infested. They took the easy right down. But what do we have here? Anybody know that one? Down in southern Utah? Lake Powell. Uh, Powell. Yeah. And everybody goes there. Everybody goes down to Powell. So they're now infested. And we've actually had some Belligers hits up in Utah as well at a couple of other reservoirs. So we have several and uh, a few more places in California that have been added to the map. And then I always point out what's what's this guy? Snake. Snake in the Snake Columbia. In the, in the greater Columbia. River Basin. So this five states, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and then a couple of provinces in Canada, this is kind of what we have left in North America. Um, this is what we're striving to protect here. And that's kind of where we can get on the same page as if a boat comes into Idaho and goes into American Falls. We can expect the, the mussels to take the easy ride down and to later end up in the Columbia. When you talk to Columbia, you talk about Rapid River and how much fish money gets pumped into the system and how much hydropower is taken into account, how much irrigation, then that's the system that we're trying to protect. So, 
88, Great Lakes, took the easy ride down, 2007.